maiden voyage of Security Super Friends. And again, I am just super excited to have yet another super friend join me, and that's Eli Khan. Say hello, Eli. Hey, everyone. Nice to be here. Yes. And he's going to introduce himself thoroughly, but he's going to start by telling us who his favorite superhero is. Now, don't be too judgy on him. <laughs> My guess is this one's probably, do you use this question a lot? No, it was just for you. Okay. If it goes over well, I'll use it again. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm a huge Wolverine geek. Uh, why? I mean, adamantium claws. I mean, is there another reason why? They're freaking awesome. Uh, but if I was going to try to connect that back to security, I mean, self, he's a self-healing organism. I mean, that's what we want our security organizations and processes and technologies to be self-healing. So I think there's actually a nice parallel between Wolverine superpowers and the superpowers that we hope security organizations to have, to be you know, self-healing, uh, have self-healing capabilities. All right. That's a pretty good answer. And I, I double dog <laughs> dare any future victims to give a better answer than that. And, you know, why I like Wolverine is he's got like the, he's got the COVID-9 kind of sideburns, you know, you know <laughs> like I've got going on. I shaved, I shaved for you today. So I oh, you did? Those. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a little scruffy, but, you know, hey, what can I say? So, all right. I, you know, you've got a long and storied past in security. Uh, you know, let's start with you just telling us about yourself. People who listen to this kind of thing are very interested in how people grow their careers, the different kinds of permutations and changes, but it'd be great for you to just, you know, kind of tell your story and feel free to, you know, take a James Joyce length novel. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's partially planned, partially random, probably like most people's careers. Uh, I, in college, I, I got hooked on the idea of doing something in the national security space. I was an environmental science major, but interested in the intersection of environmental science and national security, and did an internship at the EPA that sent me to Russia on a nuclear nonproliferation program, uh, and spent the summer mucking around submarine bases and nuclear silos, and just got convinced that I wanted to do something national security. So after college, uh, I actually ended up going to a consulting firm, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, that did a lot of national security work. And I landed in DC, October 2001, about three weeks after 9-11, and suddenly everything was homeland security. So I spent uh, much of my initial time as a consultant actually working with the, the emerging Department of Homeland Security uh, helping them think through how to take these 22 different agencies and melt them together into a unified department. I think they're still in the process of getting there. And, um, you know, cybersecurity at the time was actually more of an afterthought. People were worried about people blowing up planes. And so I was focused primarily on aviation security risks. Uh, but uh, I then worked on a program to help prevent folks from tampering the barcodes in your boarding passes uh, by embedding a digital signature in them and coming up with a new standard for 2D barcodes and that have digital signatures. And suddenly I was a cybersecurity expert nice. uh, because I had worked on this project that got really good traction, still used today. I actually did not consider myself a cybersecurity expert at all at the time, uh, but was suddenly thrown into it. Uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, was taking on a much larger responsibility within the federal government around organizing our federal cybersecurity practices. So I got a chance to, to learn on the job. Um, uh, I then got selected to do a rotation through the White House, working for the National Security Advisor on cybersecurity strategy and policy. And after a year or so of that, uh, I was set to recycle back into uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security machinery, and decided to hit the eject button and go off to grad school, uh, business school, with the, the goal of starting a cybersecurity company and connected up with some folks from the NSA that were working on uh, NSA's big data platform. And uh, we started a company called Squirrel together uh, as I was graduating from, from business school. And we had a a really great run taking some open source technology that the NSA had put out there 
transforming it into what we called a threat hunting platform, and then eventually sold Squirrel after about five years of, of a roller coaster ride to Amazon Web Services. And I've been there for the last two and a half years as a principal product manager. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. So, you know, I know this is gonna sound really trivial. Uh, the questions I would ask after that great story is, why the name Squirrel? <laughs> you know, we had, um, it, was, uh, it was a little kitschy to be honest, but you know, we, the, the, the technology that NSA had open source was actually a massively scalable database. So we had this uh, general idea of like, uh, this database is like a squirrel collecting nuts. Uh, but we also like the idea of secret squirrel as a as sort of a play on that, you know, given our intelligence community heritage. Uh, so, and you know, we couldn't afford any vowels. Uh, you know, we would prefer to actually have the entire word squirrel spelled out, uh, but vowels are very expensive in <laughs> domains. And we found someone with a domain squirrel that didn't have any vowel, uh, vowels and uh, was much cheaper, especially for a seed stage startup. Okay, now I, now I say something really cheesy. And occasionally even a blind squirrel gets a nut <laughs> and you got bought by Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> so well, tell, us about, great tell us about that. Yeah. There was plenty of, uh, plenty of cool mascots we could get around, for, around the office, including a, a stuffed brown squirrel that I, I had on our desk, on my desk. Um, but yeah, getting acquired by Amazon, gosh, I couldn't imagine a better landing spot for us. Um, you know, we, <laughs> Uh, Squirrel was built around Hadoop technology. Uh, and back in 2012, Hadoop was like the coolest thing on the street. By the time we had uh, sold Squirrel, you know, Hadoop was being overtaken by you know, cloud databases and cloud storage. So I feel like we not only got out at the right time, but uh, we landed and you know, you know, honestly, I couldn't imagine a better place to land in terms of uh, landing somewhere that is working on the cutting edge of the technologies that both large and small enterprises are adopting. Right. Without, you know, obviously giving away any secret sauce and all that, because um, I could just see like people descending from the ceiling and carrying you off if you revealed anything, you know, too deep about AWS. But tell us a little bit about, I'd like to hear about what you're working on, let the, let the folks know about what you, you know, what the thing that you manage. And I think it would be great for them to also understand how your background, particularly your, your government background and as a founder, how that's really helped you build what you're building now. Yeah. So uh, I'm working on a, uh, a product or service inside AWS called AWS Security Hub. It does a couple of different things. Uh, one, it helps you do automated security checks. Um, think cloud security posture management. Uh, so it's looking at your various AWS services that you're using, the AWS resources that you've stood up and deployed into your AWS accounts, and it's assessing whether you're using those services and resources associated and aligned to security best practices. So we're doing a whole bunch of automated security checks around those security best practices. We're also doing some things that are similar to what you would see in a SIM a security information event management tool in that we're also aggregating and normalizing and helping you prioritize all your security alerts. So ultimately we're helping customers understand, am I secure in AWS and what do I need to do to improve my security by doing both these automated security checks, but also collecting all your other security data that you're generating from both other AWS services like GuardDuty, Inspector, or Macy, or third-party security products. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we're up to. Uh, that's what we're up to now. I think there was another part of your question that I forgot. Oh, so now your your role in that is you are the product leader, right? Yeah. So I'm the I'm the product lead for that, um, which has been fun because actually I was never officially in a product manager role <laughs> until I came to AWS and decided I was ready for a new challenge. At Squirrel, I led you know, our BD, our marketing, some of our sales efforts. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to jump into something a little bit more technical, allow me to really work closely with our uh, various engineers 
And, you know, in terms of, you know, leveraging government experience, you know, in AWS, there's just so many amazingly talented engineers. It's a, it's a culture of builders. Um, and, you know, the, the really cool thing about the position is I can take the security knowledge that I have and then just dive deep with our engineers and figure out how to tr translate uh, these various concepts of security into features that are one, really easy to use and, and two, you know, help raise a customer security posture. So, I mean, what do I do? I, I basically talk to customers all day, uh, understand their pain points and needs, and then write documents that we have this mechanism inside AWS called press releases and frequently asked questions. Instead of writing product requirements documents, we actually write press releases that uh, explain the requirements in very plain speak English. And so I, I talk to a lot of customers, understand the requirements, and then write press releases and frequently asked questions that translate those requirements into, into feature sets. Right, okay, that's, that's great. I mean, it, I imagine it's just a cesspool of engineering IQ, and so uh, that's, that's just awesome to, to be in such an environment. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. I'm gonna jump right into the belly of the whale. The whale. So I wanna um, chat a bit about the shared responsibility model. And for those of you listeners who don't know what that is, listen, as we've digitally transformed, right? As we've gone from, you know, was data centers before, then to renting compute and data centers, now to cloud services, now to multi-cloud and cloud native, et cetera. We've transferred more and more of our stack risk to third parties, and obviously, you know, AWS is a leader in that regard. And so I want to talk about that as infrastructure shifts left and becomes more developer-defined everything, more and more serverless, no ops, et cetera, what will be out of scope for the public cloud provider, right? Or said differently, what will remain? What do you think will always remain with the practitioner? Like for those that are going to be using your services, what are the sorts of things that will you believe will persist over time. Because more, you guys have, rightly so, we want to go fast, I want to sell things, I'm in business to do things, right? And I get more of that off to you guys. That means less infrastructure responsibility for my teams left back at home. I mean, my company uses this as well, it's the same sort of thing. What do you see though for the practitioner will likely remain in scope for the next five or 10 years? What, what do you think doesn't change? Yeah, so really quickly on the shared responsibility model, you know, for folks that aren't familiar with that, it's, you know, it basically says that AWS will be responsible for everything hypervisor and below. So, you know, all the servers that we run on, you know, we're going to take care of all the patching of those servers. We're going to, you know, have the intrusion detection systems associated with that underlying infrastructure. We're going to make sure the hypervisor itself is secure. And then customers are responsible for everything above the hypervisor. So when you deploy EC2 instances or containers, you know, ultimately you're responsible uh, for making sure that those are secure. But I think there's a piece of the shared responsibility model that's oftentimes misunderstood in that we're not going to just leave you on your own to uh, secure your capabilities above the hypervisor. You know, our goal is to uh, make security simple. So make AWS should be the easiest place to get security right. And that involves both us developing various security products that you can use to help satisfy your end of the shared security model, and also have a very deep partner ecosystem. Uh, you know, we have thousands of security partners as part of our Amazon partner network uh, and working closely with them as well to help secure our customer environments. Um, so, you know, in terms of what is AWS not going to do, I think like the, probably the easiest way to answer that is AWS is not gonna do things that our customers tell us not to do. We are a, a customer obsessed uh, company with a customer obsessed culture. 90% of what we build in AWS both in terms of our general features and our security features, is what customers ask us to build. Uh, and then 10% is our interpretation of future or additional customer needs. So 
you know, oftentimes I also hear this from security partners as well. Like, okay, what should we build um, so that, uh, you know, AWS doesn't come in and eat our lunch and build the same thing. Well, I mean, in general, like I said, we build what customers ask us to build. So if customers are happy with the products that us, our security partners are already delivering, there's a, it's much less likely than we'll go build them, that we'll right. go build those same, same products. Um, but, you know, I don't think anything is off limits. I think, uh, you know, ultimately, if a customer needs something to help them improve their security of their AWS resources and services, you know, we'll potentially build it to make it easier for them to satisfy their part of the shared responsibility model. Great. That was a very thorough, well thought out answer. I'm going to have to assume you've had to answer that before. Um, so, <laughs> so that was great. That's for the innovators. I think in part people who are listening to this, uh, such as myself, and th this is going to be a little bit more of a, maybe a career oriented question. So you are in the threat management business with the squirrel, right? You still have some of that based on your uh, description earlier with seam and what have you. But I'm curious, where do you see that market and that career more in particular going? There's a number of companies that are using graph databases now, a lot of them. You guys are probably the earliest, but there are a lot more now. There's a lot more al algorithmic threat hunting, modeling. Uh, there's modeling of incident responders, like subject matter expert modeling. So like, kind of like the previous question, what part do you think remains with the company? Again, I, I'm seeing a, there's been a lot of good, bad, and ugly in the threat space, um, but where do you see that that going, particularly with your, your background? Yeah. I mean, one of the really interesting things that I've seen with Security Hub is that uh, regardless if you are like a financial services company with, you know, one of the most sophisticated security organizations in the world, or if you're, you know, the one person security shop, maybe in an earlier stage startup, ultimately a lot of the requirements are the same. Like with Security Hub, we've actually built Security Hub so that it can be used by any AWS customer. You know, the one person or zero person security shop all the way to, you know, the thousand person security organization. Um, and so when I think about requirements for threat hunting, threat management type products, or really any type of security product, um, ultimately the goal is to make the job of a security professional easier, to be a force multiplier. And I don't think that's gonna go away. I think that's gonna be the case no matter what. You know, so yes, there's lots of companies out there using more advanced machine learning, using graph algorithms, link analysis, like what we did at, at Squirrel. Uh, but ultimately the goal is to make that security analyst more productive whether you have one of them or whether you have a thousand of them. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily even a security analyst. And you know, I think one of the big trends we're starting to see is that it's not just central security teams that are responsible for security. Uh, there's this decentralization of security that's happening where it's really anyone who owns the underlying asset or resource that needs to have that enabler. Um, so, I mean, I, I really love the, the, the new security products and tooling that's coming in place that is trying to take expertise and democratize it, um, so that you don't need a thousand person security team to do security well. Maybe you need a small handful of folks that can sort of orchestrate this tooling put in place the right requirements, know how to write an SOW to bring in the right consultants or contractors at time. Uh, but you don't need an army of security analysts. You need, you know, tooling that can serve as those force multipliers. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think sometimes people rightly or wrongly fear that their careers or whatnot are going to be completely disintermediated. And I think you're right. I think what we're going to see is the ability to, to scale, um, and you know, the thing is, as there's more scale, as we expose more value to more people through more channels, meaning as we move into cloud native, for example, there, our ability is gonna be able to create more. And you know what, I think in some cases that can create some more risk. And so there's more opportunity for, uh, for practitioners. And along those lines, so how do you see the role of the security practitioner changing, particularly in relationship to cloud native? So what does cloud native do? It, it shifts 
even more of that freedom and responsibility, you kind of hinted at that, by the way, but it shifts even more of that left, meaning that infrastructure as code, when you think about uh, not just containers, but Kubernetes and Kubernetes as a service, you know, serverless, functions as a service, backend as a service, et cetera, all the, all the AAS stuff. What do you think, how is that going to change the role of security? You mentioned that the traditional security you kind of hinted at that maybe changing. Tell me more about what you're actually seeing out there, particularly as we again see that big shift left into more what I'll call cloud native. Yeah, I think there's an entirely new type of security persona that's emerging, um, and I haven't seen this written up written about that much yet. But I've seen this with some of our larger customers, the cloud native ones, the ones that have you know, you know, large app development teams on AWS building, uh, building new solutions. And that persona is the security campaign manager. So uh, you know, I think traditionally you had a centralized security operations center and everything ran through that security operations center. You know, all the alerts were being centralized in a SIM uh, you had tier one, two, three analyst teams sifting through that, those alerts, prioritizing, triaging them, passing them on, ultimately investigating, resolving them. That's never going to completely go away because you do need at least some centralization to help with, you know, large scale incident management to, you know, track incidents that might span over time and across organizations there's definitely a need for that. But uh, I think what's happening more and more is that, you know, especially with cloud, you know, the primary pain point is less about, you know, APT style attacks and more about misconfigurations. You know, have you configured your services and resources correctly? That's, that's the biggest pain point. And for those types of issues, you need a, a, a security person or persons that are defining what are those uh, policies or best practices that your organization needs to conform to. And then you need that person to act as a campaign manager and not only push those policies out across the, the organization, uh, but also automate them so that they're producing automated security results and then farming those automated security results, the results of those checks out to the actual resource or asset owners, because they're the ones that are ultimately gonna fix them. So instead of all those alerts being going to a centralized security team to figure out, you know, that security campaign manager is taking those alerts and essentially routing them to the right resource owner, asset owner to fix and then tracking progress across the organization. How many of these outstanding security issues have gone unacknowledged? How many have a fixed by date? How many have actually been fixed? You know, which parts of my organization have the most problems? Uh, how do I properly nudge these resource owners and incentivize them to take corrective action as a partner, as opposed to just always using a stick? How do I use you know, positive reinforcement to, to enact change and in, in behavior changes. So I think this idea of a security campaign manager is, is, is something that we'll see more and more of in the future. I, I like it and I can hear all my security super friends out there now going to their LinkedIn and updating it with a new, <laughs> a new hopeful title. I think you're right, by the way. I mean, I really do. I think with the fact that we can, we've abstracted so much as, as software, we can do so much more in terms of you know, again, exposing more value, we need some way just to bring it all together, right? To do a big bear hug around that. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. This will probably be our last question. So Ellen Ullman, she's a famous author, programmer. She said, quote, we build our computer systems the way we build our cities over time without a plan on top of ruins, end quote. So I look at things like, you know, what we call backend as a service, you know, functions as a service or just plain old serverless and the fears of lock-in, right? We're abstracting much more service, services, right? All cloud providers are, right? But there's this fear that with that abstraction, right? 
with trying to even abstract business logic, right? That's what I'm getting to here, is there, there's, there's a sphere of lock-in. So, you know, the question I have as a security innovator, as a practitioner, as someone who's running one of the more important products out there, how are you thinking about that future? Where again, there's more abstraction, right, into the serverless. We're dealing with people who are probably have a multi-cloud appetite, right? And they're so they're dealing with you know various you know SaaS capabilities, APIs. They have multi-cloud. They have teams who are just spinning up stuff at will, right? Again, kind of the wild west. How are you guys thinking about that future? Particularly in light of the fact that I also hear a lot about fear of lock-in as we abstract more and try to deal with business logic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is one of the things I love about AWS and Amazon culture is that there always is a plan. <laughs> you know, nothing is random. There's always a very well thought out plan. And, you know, with our security services, we have a set of a half dozen tenants that guide the direction for our security services. And, you know, one of the most important tenants we have is we want AWS to be the simplest place to get security right and the hardest place to get security wrong. Nice. This is one of our, our important tenants. And, you know, it's not just words on paper. We actually really mean that. You know, every new security service and feature we think about through that lens. And so, you know, with AWS, there's a there's 175 different AWS services and products. It's a huge landscape to cover. Um, and so our focus is covering that landscape and making sure that, you know, customers are using uh, any AWS service can have high assurance that they can use it in a secure manner. Um, but, you know, one thing that we want to avoid, which I see happen, you know, inside the security industry more largely is, you know, customers hate having too many tools. You know, they want to make sure that any new tool they are providing uh, is either replacing something they already have or, or is truly uh, something that is uh, differentiated. So from the AWS perspective, our goal is not to just create more and more tools, but really to expand our current tool sets like Security Hub, Guard Duty, Macy, and Spectre, and make sure that they cover the full spectrum of services and capabilities that are needed uh, by customers. So, you know, I think in general, you know, the less tooling that the customer needs to work with and deal with, it makes their lives easier. So we're trying to expand coverage but do it in like a really smart way where that doesn't necessarily mean they have to like install or set up or configure new tools. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of PTSD out there. I have yet to hear a customer say, oh, yay, I can't wait to have yet another tool to interrupt my life. And I, I don't, I never hear that. Right. Yeah. So I, I resonate with that a lot. Hey, you've been super generous and super awesome. Uh, and you chose a great superhero. Um, one, one, by the way, I'll point out that doesn't have a cape. So, um, it's just, why, why didn't Wolverine, Storm had a cape, but Wolverine didn't, Magneto had a cape. I don't know why he- I'm sure there's a, there's a, there's gotta be one episode where he wore a cape. Yeah. I, got, I gotta imagine. Yeah, we need to, we need to figure that out. But hey, you've been awesome. Thank you for being a, you know, a friend of mine and a security super friend. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. So yeah, have a, just a wonderful week and keep on making super awesome products at AWS. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Really appreciate it.